we're delighted to be back with the Donahue Group. Uh, the four of us so enjoyed just sitting around and talking about consequential things that we have absolutely no control over, and uh, so that makes it, uh, I think, even more fun. My name is Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm the alleged host of the show and uh, certainly enjoy that position without any power attached to it. My trusty uh, uh, mates here, Ken Risto, uh, social studies uh, teacher and director of curriculum and assessment for the Sheboygan Area School District. Tom Paneski, math professor at the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan campus. Cal Potter, politician, legislator extraordinaire, former state senator. It's your turn this week. <laughs> uh, and uh, assistant superintendent uh, for uh, library services at the uh, formerly at the Department of Public Instruction. So we're here. We're talking about state issues, but we had gotten so involved in our last conversation about Blue Harbor that we didn't really have a chance to touch on the county referenda uh, questions relating to the nursing homes. Interesting issues, and um, there are two questions that, as I understand, that are going to be on the April ballot. One is whether or not the county can exceed its uh, revenue caps in order to uh, continue support of the two county-owned nursing homes, and whether just in general, if I have that right, Cal, you probably are... I haven't seen the wordage, uh, exactly. Okay. Uh, well, the, the, This is going to be the advisory, I believe. It is then, advisory. And then in November would be the binding. Right. <clears throat> and one of the reasons you want to do an advisory referendum is that the language that is um, required by statute in a binding referendum is very, very limited and, from what I can tell, kind mm -hmm. of confusing. So this is a way, I think, to educate voters about what they're really voting for. And, and I, I know that the county board had a lot of conflict about... How the, uh, how the questions were worded, but that second question actually asks whether, <clears throat> just in general, we can exceed the revenue caps. Uh, Sheboygan County continues to struggle, and I think it's doing a good job with its budget issues, but it, we don't have a county sales tax. I think there are only 14 counties, I may be wrong, but a, a fairly small number of counties that do not have mm -hmm. a, a county sales tax, so those budget issues are, 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 are important. Just on the nursing homes, any predictions on where it's going to land or what's going to, what the decision is going, or the advice is going to be for the county board? Well, the, my advice would be that don't stray too far from the intent of the circulators and signers of those petitions. Uh, when you have 9,000 signatures that are submitted to you asking for a referendum that pretty clearly says, do we want to continue operating these nursing homes? I think that's a pretty direct intent by the circulators and signers. Now, when you start getting into all the details, um, you can, I think, get off onto revenue caps and tax bases and all kinds of other things that then all of a sudden people say, these guys are trying to complicate the issue. Maybe the intent in some cases is not to do that, but I think the public reaction here can be very, very negative as to what the intent then of the people in offices. I mean, people are generally very cynical about <coughs> politicians and their intent. Mm. And uh, if these referendums uh, on the April ballot and subsequently the one in, in November clearly don't uh, match what people thought they were going to get as a result of asking through this referendum, I think there's going to be a lot more hostility than a calming of the waters mm. that you would think Actually, would Actually, I, I did see the language <clears throat> for both of the referenda. and. It was pretty straightforward, I thought, and and it well, is difficult. It is difficult to craft a question. Um, I saw the result of Senator Leibham's poll um, that I think was printed in the in the Beacon, uh, and I would just suggest Tom might disagree, but I would suggest that the way the questions were worded may have suggested certain answers, and that's always the issue oh, sure. that you that you yeah. face when you're trying to develop a neutral question. But I I thought that. I thought that the two questions that I saw in the paper were pretty straightforward. Um, they don't reflect the complexity of the issue, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and people do need to be educated on, on what it means to run a nursing home, what the, there are clear pluses, there are clear minuses, uh, and I mean, I think what the county board is trying to do is just struggle with that balance, and mm -hmm. it's tough. Because yeah, they're related, but yeah. I think the public really has in mind, yeah, you can ask me whether we want to exceed the cap on spending and, and whether we want to be more generous in our tax dollars, but we also over here want to have a decision on whether we want these nursing homes or not. So I think, well, you know, they're related because obviously mm -hmm. the running of these nursing homes includes uh, the need for more revenue, 
The people do view, I think, these as two separate questions. You right. can ask me that, but don't put them together and confuse me because then I might vote no when I really want to vote yes for nursing homes, and I, but I don't want you to raise my taxes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what the people are looking for as far as clarity are, are these two con different concepts. Sure, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Um, but where does that put us? I mean, if you vote yes, I want nursing homes and, and I want them run by the county, and but no, don't touch my taxes. Um, the way you they're know. structured is but not that's an why it's either a complex or. issue yeah. that yeah. needs to be explained fully. But right. uh, people look at things a little more simply, I think, than sometimes the people. Well, that's why we have a representative mm -hmm. government <laughs> for people to study the details. Right. But I think the people here uh, have a fear that there's uh, there are some that would like to just get out of the nursing home business. And I think the general public out there says there is room for Sheboygan County to maintain nursing home services and the uh, debate can be over what level, but I just think that people are endeared to Rocky Knoll and, and Sunny Ridge and have been for years and uh, have invested dollars, unlike most counties, in nursing homes. That's true, you know, we are a rather unique county, one of a, just a handful that continue to have nursing homes. Well, and for example, the, um, there's actually a charitable foundation uh, set up with both nursing homes uh, that collects donations that people just, without even the county or nursing homes asking for donations because they don't, uh, but they have a balance of over fifty-six thousand dollars just because people feel charitably toward the mm -hmm. institution that took good care of their yes. parents or relatives. Mm -hmm. So, well, it'll be interesting. Let's move on to some state issues. As we are taping, to me, one of the most fascinating trials, maybe not of the century, mm -hmm. but at least uh, in in the state of Wisconsin, is Scott Jensen's trial. Mm -hmm. I think I had made some bold statement. In a, during one of our last tapings, <clears throat> that there was simply no way that Scott Jensen would actually go to trial, and he's now well into the second week of that trial, and it is quite amazing. Two things I want to talk about is, as I'm reading, there's not much in the Sheboygan Press about it, but as I'm reading online, um, one, I, I love the theory, uh, which is everybody's doing it, so what's the problem? And number two, and I think this is something that just speaks to, is a much broader philosophical question is, all of these witnesses I believe are saying, and I think Jensen's defense theory is, you can't separate it. You can't separate campaigning from being a legislator. They go hand in hand. And so to have some artificial demarcation between fundraising and doing the job is just a sheer impossibility. Cal, yeah. I want you've your. You've done it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say you've done it. What do you? Yeah. I mean, my, my I mean, first response is that's nonsense. But you're the one that actually can did you, it. Can you separate them? Yes. Should you? Yes. Um, you just don't make those phone calls in your office on a state phone. Uh, you use uh, a during Demo normal working hours. Right. You do a Democratic Party office phone, or you do it from your own home, or and then you don't involve state employees. You don't ask them on their own time. It's on their vacation time on weekends and evening if they're going to work for you as a, as a sort of a private citizen when they're off of work. So yeah, you, you can, it's manageable, you can do it. Um, the contention that this is widespread, I would say yes, it probably is. When you start talking about million dollar state senate races, uh, you're talking about big bucks. You're talking about uh, putting together television buy packages. You're talking about doing fancy brochures. You're doing a lot of different things that cost a lot of money, and it involves a lot of people. So the crossing of that line by they using state time, state phones, um, maybe going to this business or that business or doing a television buy on state time or, or during working hours without claiming vacation or personal leave or whatever. I'm sure those things have happened in, in other offices other than the four legislators who have been uh, indicted. I mean, I don't think that the, all the ills of the political world today fall down on Fody, Ladwig, uh, Jensen, and Koala. I think that's for naive to say that. And I think Jensen's attorneys are simply saying, uh, yeah, you, you my client is not uh, Lily White here, but he's just one of four that has been uh, singled out, and I wouldn't doubt that they're going to lay out the broadness of this with the idea that when a plea bargain does come after the so many weeks of trial, that indeed the plea bargain is one of maybe a misdemeanor or something like Ladwig got, uh, that he contained 
maintain his office or whatever comes along with mm -hmm. uh, uh, being a misdemeanor rather than a felony. Um, but I think uh, they're making a point, and, and maybe the point should be made. As we've had a, a guest in Jay Heck from Common Cause, uh, this is happening on all levels, federal, state, when you get big campaign, expensive campaigns, and shaking down of in special interest groups. And I think it has to stop because we need, re we need reform. And maybe we need to continue to expose what's going on in a broader sense, rather than say these are the four dirty people, and if we can lock them up, we've solved all our problems, and we haven't. Well, and the interesting thing about the way the testimony is developing from state Supreme Court Justice David Prosser uh, to you know anyone that you can think of, it's apparently done all the time. I read that the Republicans, Tom in your blue sweater, um, are furious with Jensen for not only hanging the dirty laundry out, um, but making sure that there's a big enough breeze to flap it so that people can't, can't uh, not pay attention to it. I haven't been following it that closely, but I, I kind of agree with what you, just, what you started with. Uh, what's the big deal? It's just part of politics. Uh, okay. You get the job done, you answer to your constituents, you respond to constituents, people call you. And where does it, where's the line? It's really great. I mean, I, I was a city councilman. Uh, I worked at the university here. I had to teach classes. I, I'm in my office. I get a call from the mayor's office or something or somebody. I respond to make another call to somebody else. And I'm doing city politics, but I'm here at the university because the call came in. I respond back. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get, my, I get the job done. Now, if I were kind of a... Uh, I worked out in the field as a parks person, uh, cutting grass or garbage, picking up garbage or some other painting, and I took time for my job to do politics <laughs> and not get the painting job done or the grass cut, then yeah, that's a very clear demarcation. You're working on city time, on, on uh, taxpayer time. But when politics is what it is, uh, you're in the office, you respond to your, you know, you get paid to do things. Yeah, but I think, I mean, the, 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 the issue <laughs> here relates to raising money because hat in hand with the fact that you have all these campaign, I mean, they call them campaign workers, although they are paid with our tax money, were paid with our tax money. Um, what they're buying or what they're selling is influence and access and in exchange for money. Um, well, one of the things that I think we have to realize is that Wisconsin, when the, con the caucus uh, staffs were created, both in the Assembly and the Senate, they were meant to do research and serve the creation of and the forwarding of public policy, uh, studying of bills, studying of creating papers, issue papers, where what's being done in other states and so it was purely issue and policy oriented now these folks have basically dropped so much of that okay. and when we get into the campaign time they're literally out there either knocking on doors or doing the really the campaign stuff and that's where the line has been crossed yeah and i i just i'd have to agree with cal i think that there's a way it's not easy and it would be much nicer to have just a seamless operation, which is not only will I get the job done, I will ensure that I have the job that I can get done and just kind of do it all in part and parcel. But I mean, as a taxpayer, I don't want to pay for that. Whether it's, and, yes, and interestingly enough, I mean, I think Mark Green and Scott Walker are taking, are, are getting chopped here a little bit because they were clearly doing this stuff or they're, they had, they had some issues, at least. I mean, Jensen has pointed fingers toward them as much as anybody else. Uh, but it, Doyle's campaign manager, Rich, Rich Judge, um, was a, a campaign worker for an assembly person, I believe. I may have that wrong. But it's an equal opportunity uh, kind of problem. It seems to plague the Democrats as much as the Republicans. I mean, it's on a national level, I mean, I think Jack, Jack Abramoff probably gave a whole lot more money to the Republicans, but he certainly had his uh, had his handout to Democrats as well. And so, I mean, I think it is reflective of just how the whole system has developed. And for me, it's a problem. Well, yeah. it's a problem because government, the people we elect to office or should be there to <clears throat> care about education, the environment, and many, many other issues, <clears throat> and not whether people who are on the state payroll are making enough phone calls to 
reach a million dollars for the next campaign. That's, that's completely opposite of what we send these people to Washington or Madison to do. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure all of you are quite as <coughs> interested in this trial as I am, but any predictions? Do we have um, a guilty verdict? Do we have a plea bargain? Um, well, if, if the strategy is to go to the jury and say everybody else is doing it, that's a recipe for disaster You're as a defense to... lawyer because I think those people who are paying attention to it or the jury that's watching this and they have no choice but to pay attention to it, I think are going to say, well, then we're more inclined to make an example of you than we are to, let, to exonerate you because everybody else is doing it. I would still think, you know, I mean, we're wrong, but I still think they're going to, I, I would agree with, we talked off camera a little bit, there's still going to be some sort of a plea here near the end because I just think that um, this gets uglier and uglier as it plays out. And it's, it's an election year. Nobody wants this stuff in front of folks. Uh, it's just asking for trouble on both sides of the aisle. Right. Nobody wants it's this. It's not only that everybody else is doing it, but yeah. the more people, other people talk about it, the more in-depth the public sees this whole shenanigan stuff is. Yeah. And I think the more you're saying, boy, you did all that, even though he may not have, they've laid out all these, uh, these on the other bad hand, policies. On mm -hmm. the other hand, you have a prosecutor, I'm a prosecutor myself, and there are, there are decisions that a prosecutor makes uh, that take place in a bigger context, which is how will the client react or how will the public react, the district attorneys being different than just like the kind of city prosecution that I do. But the longer this goes on, the more I think it will be difficult for this DA to pull back and plea bargain a misdemeanor. I mean, this guy has dragged everybody through the mud, and it, was, and it happened just so that he would, there would be a plea bargain on a misdemeanor. I don't think so. And part of the problem is, is if Jensen, as I understand it, if Jensen's uh, convicted of a felony, he is out of the legislature. Mm -hmm. And um, so why he didn't take the plea bargain in the first place, I mean, you know, like we said about Bill Clinton, what were you thinking? I, I mean, I have to, I have to think. Of, I mean, if I were that prosecutor, a plea bargain was the last thing in the world that I'd want to do. But, well, we'll... <laughs> The we'll next see. time, the we'll next time we gather, there'll either be a, a plea bargain or a verdict. Just some interesting uh, uh, figures from the big money blog of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. Um, just to put in perspective how much money does have to be raised, um, a total of nearly $23 million was spent on the 2002 governor's race by candidates and special interest groups, triple the $8 million spent in the 1998 race. Um, Doyle him projection for this year. Oh, 40? Yes. 40 million? That's what I've been reading. Yeah. 40 to 50, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, so double. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with Doyle's record breaking fundraising and the, the point of the, of the democ Wisconsin democracy campaign, as they pick on poor Governor Doyle. <laughs> I would well, like, poor is not the word. Well, no, to. yes. No, he's pretty wealthy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the unfortunate Governor the, Doyle. Yeah, the, the, what's he done wrong this week? Well, as you know, I, I like Governor Doyle, but um, uh, he's out Tommy, Tommy Thompson. Uh, uh, Tommy is still the all-time champion money raiser, but Doyle is, is, is gaining on him quickly so far. And this Good was. To see the two parties are competitive. There you go. <laughs> there you go. When the Democrats do it, it's you know. I remember. It's okay, right? Yeah. I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. <laughs> I remember the um, some uh, Republican senator questioning Harold Ickes on some matter before the the the, the before a congressional committee, and the the senator says, "Mr. Ickes, where did you learn how to do that, or what made you think that was right?" And he said. Senator, we're just doing what President Reagan did, <laughs> but a small point. In any event, uh, Doyle has raised $5.9 million for his uh, re-election bid compared to $3.2 million that Thompson raised at the same point in his last campaign. So, and of course, we read in the, in the Journal Sentinel this, uh, this Sunday about uh, former Governor uh, uh, Thompson is doing very well in the private sector and seems to be thriving and hasn't ruled out a return to Wisconsin for, for another race. Um, we'll see. Um, I'm interested in, in the position of Russ Feingold, uh, not even mentioned in a Gallup poll as to a recent Gallup poll about who would be most likely to be, who would get the most support as, a, as the Democratic Party candidate. In the same article, though, I read that um, Feingold regularly does 
is the number one choice among internet voters and internet polls and and, and blog, so forth. bloggers and, and bloggers polls are there there are two kinds of internet I mean there's the Republican blog and there's a Democrat blog mm -hmm. and of course uh, the real rapid uh, rabid uh, Democrats like Feingold. <laughs> It's, you know, they don't like these wishy-washy other senators. Feingold comes out and supports their positions. So triangulators. That, yeah. triangulators. <laughs> you just see the president. And so they, against these triangulators. You know, they you know see him. Hillary triangulating. Yeah. They know him yeah. real well, and they love it. They feed on that kind of stuff. I know, you know, I've, I've talked to some people who have talked to him, and, and he actually is kind of, Feingold is asking people, what do you think I should do? And maybe he is considering a Howard Dean type of insurgency um, and if he can avoid rebel yells in the middle of primaries, maybe he'll go further than Howard Dean did. But um, I think he's giving it. I think he is giving it a real run because I think there are uh, there is a segment of the Democratic Party that would like the Democrats to be Democrats. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think I would call that being rabid. I, I think it, it would rabid. be you know just uh, <laughs> well, trying to be part of the progressive. Uh, well, see, I call it rabbit. You, you, for the Republican side, you call it right wing, uh, religious something or other. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's, I, I just think Feingold is a very interesting. Um, yeah. In fact, your wife gave me uh, her uh, copy of the February Vogue magazine. Not necessarily a heavy hitter in, in terms of politics. Long article on Russ Feingold. It was between makeup tips and yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. eat your heart out. You wish you had a nice magazine like that, but um, it, yeah, we call general. It's called, <laughs> it's called GQ. In fact. Yeah. We do have a magazine like that. You're supposed to shave more for television. Yeah, what can I, I say? Yeah. But uh, in any event, um, remember Feingold came out of nowhere. You know, back in '92, I think was his for the first year he was elected. Right. And um, I, for one, am going to watch it with, with great interest. Molly Ivins has a fabulous column, uh, both in her, in her regular Star Telegram, uh, but also, I think, printed in the Progressive, really taking on the Democrats for not being Democrats and for triangulating themselves mm -hmm. to the point that, that they don't mean anything to anybody anymore. And it was, it was a most interesting article. And I think Feingold is enough of a renegade. And, on both sides of the fence, uh, I mean, he, he's, he's hard to predict, or at least so far has been hard to predict. And so I think, I think it's uh, you know, potentially interesting stuff. Well, I think he comes out of that race that you cited where he was in that primary where the other two candidates literally knocked themselves off. Oh, yeah, and yeah. then he, he walked right into this thing. And I think he sees the potential probably on the national level with uh, uh, somebody doing a Howard Dean yell or something, and all of a sudden uh, he, being low on the list, rises by his own uh, pure image mm -hmm. and clear image and stand on certain issues, and that he could rise to be a, a very viable candidate. Um, you know, on the paper, he isn't. I mean, he's from the north. He's from a smaller state. Um, mm -hmm. He's a person who's divorced twice. Um, he's got a, some baggage, and as a result, you and would he's not... A yeah, and he's Jewish. Put it on the table. Right, and so he's got baggage that people would say, well, if the population that controls this country is California, Texas, Florida, you know, Arizona, some of the other states, um, where's, his, where's his constituency? Where's his base? Um, a lot of it right now, I think, is the liberal Democrat um, that was there to push uh, uh, George McGovern at one time. Uh, mm -hmm. they, Jimmy Carter came out of nowhere as well. Uh, people who saw the, these people as good people, um, honest people, and, but they weren't electable nationally. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think Feingold is going to have to have a lot of other stars align uh, to get into uh, being a strong, viable candidate for the presidency. But don't you think one of the things that we can agree on that just seems to me to be patently clear at local, state, and national politics is we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people who actually seem to talk and walk and think what they really mean and are willing to put themselves out in some kind of sincere way. I mean, I, I think that's where McCain has legs, is that, I mean, why Democrats are, are willing to consider a Kerry uh, McCain ticket. I mean, McCain is a profoundly conservative 
mm -hmm. legislator, goodness gracious. And yet he seems to have... He has the a, image a, of credibility and leadership, yeah. and which, which uh, Bill Clinton had in spite of all his personal problems and his decisions and his love life. He uh, was somebody that people respected that could lead the troops. Um, he was competent, mm -hmm. he was intelligent, and I think that's what frustrated Republicans. They couldn't drag down that image that he had as being a good, uh, smart individual. See, I think that plays out in the primaries, but I don't think a lot of people really knew how conservative, better for worse, McCain really, really is true. and was. That's true. You know, and I think there's there's a there's a sense in the primaries where you you really are pulling your base to come in and vote for you, especially when you have closed primaries now where you get a candidate, but when you get to the general election and people really start, they will certainly look at personality and leadership and those types of things, but the pressures to, to get to the center and stay in the center is, are just awfully demanding. And I just don't know yeah. how a guy like McCain, uh, well, like Feingold can actually negotiate that transition yeah. from if he were would he get me close to, getting close to a nomination. You hear a lot about people looking for leadership, looking for that, that person who can bring us all together. Mm -hmm. But yet, if you look at the voting patterns, uh, people who are concerned about guns and abortion and, and gays, yeah, and so those people, they're very rigid in what they vote who they vote for and why sure. they vote for that person. Mm -hmm. And I don't see those people changing a great deal. No, but, so, but it's a senator, too. There's a, uh, senators don't normally get elected. That's very true. To a president. You usually get Kennedy. governors. Kennedy. Governors Kennedy get elected. Uh, Reagan, Carter. Uh, sure. Clinton. Uh, Clinton. 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 Bush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Governors get elected. Less and, baggage. Than some, some but, of they have, but they also have a, they're in an administrative leadership role mm -hmm. more so than a senator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think it's very difficult to get elected out of the Senate. Uh, I mean, historically, I don't know why that is necessarily. I would trust a, a senator, it seems to me, would have a better sense of national issues than the governor of Arkansas or Georgia or, the, well, the California. Most, the but, most prevailing theory is, is that senators have a hard time talking in sound bites. They're used to the Senate floor where they can bloviate on and on and on. And, <laughs> and, and, and when you get into the campaign where you have to reduce, unfortunately, you have to reduce complex issues into, Understand. you know, there you go again. I mean, yeah. or whatever sound bite you want, you want to, you want to make famous. You know, well, where's I think the beef? Senators also are considered yeah. politicians, and whereas sure. governors, again, are administrators or they're sort of the darling of, a, of another level, yeah, another yeah. world almost, and I think that's part of it. And if you're a successful governor, you can turn and say, I have a track record of success. I mean, what do you do at the Senate? You say, well, I voted here four times and I voted here six times. I got times. this bill passed. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 and then you've got the inevitable, I mean, you can look at a governor and see what bills he signed or vetoed, but you have senators who are doing procedural votes, and then you get the, the political lie that goes on in both campaigns. He increased your taxes 755,000 times. Yeah. Well, because of <laughs> procedural votes and they're mm -hmm. up there tallying, it's yeah. an awfully uh, tough uh, hill is. to climb. Yeah. It well, it just, you know, in summary, as, as we wrap up, the, the state of politics and the state of politicians and such is just, uh, it's not, not as good as it could be. But we'll keep plugging away, and uh, thanks for joining us.